I appreciate WWE doing the right thing. Don't make the people wait. Give us what we want. Give us what we want. Give us this Samoan family saga. It's like a Samoan telenovela. It's just ripping and captivating. Give it to us at the beginning of the show. Like, just dive right into it. Hit us with the highlight first. And I actually think, ironically, it was a really the right choice for this week's show because starting off with this just made the rest of the night a breeze. And everything was great. But by God, the opening segment was. And you still got all of these people, of course, that want to refer to Roman Reigns as the heel. Oh my God, wrestlers once told me in shoot interviews some of the backstage lingo and some of the words associated with the business, like keeping it kayfabe and everything else. So now they've told me heel. So I'm going to say Roman Reigns is a heel because it sounds cool to say he's a heel. He is a face! If you're going to use the insider terms, use them accurately. He is a face to the baby power, baby face 100% of the way. All this man wanted on SmackDown was his just respect, his earned respect, his merited respect, and he just simply tried to demand said respect from Jey Uso. But no, 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 no. Jey Uso is the one that has to continue to keep looking the gift horse in the mouth. Jey Uso is the one that's the petulant heel here that won't up own up to the truth. Like, Rome is the one overcoming the obstacle here. It's not Jey Uso, because he can finish him off like child's play any time. The obstacle here is Jey Uso's stubbornness. It's Jey Uso's unwillingness and lack of acceptance of the absolute truth that he can be a key core cog of the Samoan family dynasty, but there is only one tribal chief, and it's Roman Reigns, and for God's sakes, all the man wants you to do is acknowledge it. He whooped your ass on Sunday. He's a universal champion. He is the tribal chief. Just say, but no, 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 no. Jay has to go down the John Cena route and deny all truth and factualities. It's fantastic. And you can even, like, what I love about the story so much is that you can feel how real it feels. Like, they're going to have a match again at Hell in a Cell. So he has now gotten his cousin, Roman has, not one main event pay-per-view payout, but two consecutively. Right in time for the holidays, people! What an unselfish act. And even as he pulled them in at the end of the segment, like he's still trying to give him a loving, encouraging words of wisdom to basically say, in no uncertain terms, you got off easy the first time. Won't be like that the second time. You mess with the bull, you get the horns! Just fantastic. But you also notice how Roman was gracious enough to exit stage left so that way Jey Uso could get some, you know, spotlight here. Get his own match with AJ Styles that Jey Uso won, like, Again, I come down to it and I'm saying, like, the first half hour of this is Roman and Jay stuff in one way, shape, or form, and I'm finding it fantastic. But you won't, Jay Uso character is complaining about Roman Reigns. Let me, let me have a family member that gets me in featured spots every week on television. Let me have a family member that got me a main event pay-per-view payout just in time for the holidays. Let me, let me then not do the one thing that I was supposed to do coming out of that match. And as a result, get a second main event, main event pay-per-view payout in time for the holidays. I wish I had family like that. You should be thankful, Jay. That's all I'm going to say. I thought it was really interesting here that they had Otis squash John Morrison. That's pretty much what it was. Like, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, like, it's... Ooh! Just for Tony. Just for the taste of one. And I hope he was tuned into SmackDown. And you know deep down he was. Tony, let me tell you something, brother. You could talk about family time all you want. But from 8 to 10 on Friday nights, it could all potentially be Jomo time. The, the wife can put the kids to bed. And you go sit your fat ass in front of the television. And you watch SmackDown. And you wait for your moment of Jomo. No homo. Okay? 
I just I thought it was interesting that they had him get squashed here so quickly. Almost kind of a travesty. Uh, speaking of guys getting squashed because they're nothing shorty G! <laughs> Gee, wonder who would have seen that coming? Everybody. This time it's the Butcher Sheamus squatching him. And Big E with apparently half of a head full of hair now. I didn't realize that the he was getting that LeBron James hair. <laughs> I was more focused on that than him issuing the challenge to Sheamus next week on SmackDown for a false count anywhere match. I'm sorry, it's me. Before you guys sit there and talk about my hairline, I got, what, a little over five months until I turned 40. You see this? Like, it's here. The, this is real. Like, these aren't Trump plugs. These aren't LeBron crappy-looking hair plugs. Like, this is real deal, legit stuff. It might not look the best, but a lot of you at 29 wish you had this hairline when you get to 39. And if you don't, shut your mouth is what I got to say. Uh, your kind of one-hour main event for this show was the KO show. And I got to say, why is KO, Kevin Owens, on SmackDown when he's a Raw guy? Eh, they're trying to pump up and hype up the WWE draft starting next Friday on SmackDown. All right, cool, whatever. But Alexa Bliss might actually pull this thing off. She might actually pull this thing off. The way she kind of presented herself, the way she kind of told it like in a lot of ways almost emotionless but you could feel the emotion in the lack of emotion in terms of what she says you know and talking about it just in like a very cult-like but also very sensual sexual type of matter about when the fiend touches you and who like you could feel that this is a necessary important turn for alexa bliss's character because she needed something and it adds another layer to the fiend Makes me think that he might be more destined to be heading to Raw. But interesting nonetheless. Uh, most interesting thing of all, though, was when Michael Cole says that everything the Fiend touches is changed forever. So that's how we do in the Fiend, huh? We talking to his baby mamas before you go on TV on Friday nights? Is that how we doing it, Mitchell Cole? We're going to talk about baby mama drama? I see you. You subtweeting baby mama drama on live national television. I don't know whether to piss all over that or respect the game. Yes, everybody where it touches gets pregnant. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. At this point, John, I was really vibing with this show. Then, of course, you get to the second hour, which leads to the inevitable Matt Riddle appearance. Like, why is he on my TV? Why can't he just go away? Why are we splitting up, teasing up, splitting up the Lucha House Party? Just why is there a need to do this? Why does there feel like it has to be done? Just why, 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 why? Why does Matt Riddle have to come right back on TV this week and get a tag match victory? Why, 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 why? So many things involving Matt Riddle are just a why. At least we didn't get a moment of bro, because that'll always be a moment that blows. Fuck Matt Riddle. And as far as other stupid things... Carmella, big reveal! Oh boy! I'm cool with if you're making her into a valet or manager type or something else. As I've always talked about, not everybody needs to wrestle and not everybody should wrestle. But the whole time it's like gives you that Emelina vibe. Like it's just, no, nah, I'm cool. Like we didn't even notice she was gone. Just saying. If this was supposed to be a big reveal, I don't know what exactly was supposed to feel big about it because it wasn't. Uh, speaking of things that were supposed to feel big but then really haven't been, Sasha Banks appears on SmackDown and issues a challenge to Bayley. Next week, those two on SmackDown for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Gotta give the folks something to try and incentivize them to tune in to watch the WWE Draft on next Friday, huh? Just couldn't wait until the pay-per-view, huh? Of course not. What are the likely chances that this is actually a fully planned out, fully booked match that actually sees a clear, decisive winner? Probably slim to none, although knowing the history, you would have Sasha Banks win the belt on SmackDown just to lose it at Hell in a Cell would be about par for the effing course here. But again, this is another week where Sasha's got some, you know, ability to show some acting chops and, and just I don't see any of it. Not at all. I hope her role in The Mandalorian is largely a silent one. So that's probably best. 
So the delivery is off, the timing is off, the execution is off. I realize in some ways you're kind of stuck to the scripting and what is written out for you and what is mapped out for you when it comes to these featured promo segments. I get that. But certain individuals still have enough overall talent and charisma to be able to pull these off. And I just think these segments with Sasha Banks have largely missed, frankly. I mean, I'm just not seeing it. Like, the taking off of the neck brace should have been a big holy crap reveal and a big type of, you know, I've been faking it the whole time too. It wasn't. It's just not working. So they finally got to the point where they split these two off. It was actually kind of looking forward to it a little bit just because maybe we finally be done with it afterwards. And you know, so far, it's not jamming for me. Maybe once we actually get to the matches, it'll jam for me no more. But right now, it doesn't. But I tell you what does jam for me and will jam for me going forward in perpetuity is Sami Zayn as the one true undefeated undisputed raising intercontinental champion. Your number two baby face on Friday Night Smackdown, people. That is, of course, Sami Zayn. And you say, this is Zayn-y to hear you saying this, Jeff, in 2020. Well, buckle up, bitches, because it's been that type of a year. But I have seen the shining light, okay? And let me tell you about what type of man Sami Zayn is. Earlier on in the night, it was fantastic. He took Jeff Hardy's fraudulent Intercontinental Championship and dropped it straight in the cash, trash can Medusa style and said, this is my title. This is the real Intercontinental Championship. And that's exactly what the hell you should do. When you grow up, you throw away the toys for the little kids and you keep the toys for the big boys. And that's what Sami Zayn did. And not only that, he had to overcome the odds in a brutal ladder match on Sunday with the odds significantly stacked against him, with both Jeff Hardy and AJ Styles, two experienced ladder match competitors, facing off against him when he was the real true Intercontinental Champion. What did he do to deserve this? Like, what did he have to do? But he went out there, handled business, got the job done, broke zero rules in the match, and he won. So he retained, not recaptured, retained, big difference, his Intercontinental Championship. Now come Friday night at SmackDown, when he's clearly in no condition to wrestle, you know, he should be resting and recuperating. Being the Intercontinental Champion is tough stuff. But this man is such tough stuff that injured ribs and everything, it doesn't matter. He's going to make sure that you, the fans, are entertained. And of course, this is all thank you, Roman, because he stepped aside early in the night and said, let me let SmackDown's number two babyface get the shine here in Sami Zayn. And that's exactly what happened. He shows he's a fighting champion by not only having this match in the main event against Jeff Hardy, but also putting the Intercontinental Championship on the line. And I know what a lot of you are going to say. Well, Sami Zayn cheated. Sami Zayn moved the, removed the turnbuckle and used it to his advantage. Look, Sami Zayn unlike certain people in this country, is taking the threat of COVID very seriously. And when he recognizes in real time that the turnbuckle, part of his workspace, is not up to strict safety and sanitation standards and specifications, he's going to call that out. So he did what any responsible employee should do, called out that there was an issue with the turnbuckle, removed it, helping the win guys do their job yet again, threw it off, gave them a chance, an opportunity to replace it. They did not. That's they asked, not Sammy. Sammy Zayn wins. He remains your Intercontinental Champion, and for that, I am very thankful. So all in all, I enjoyed SmackDown this week. It started off with a bang, and it finished with a pretty close to equivalent bang. And a couple other okay things mixed in. I know. You don't know what to make of it. Like so little negativity out of this channel. But it is what it is, man. Like that's the Roman Reigns impact. The tribal chief does that. I have no problems calling him that. Because he is our hero. He is the number one babyface. Not on SmackDown. Not just in WWE. But all of professional wrestling. And that's why OTR Central is not the wrestling show you want. Just the wrestling show you need. Because I will always, 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 always tell you the truth. Whether you want to accept it or not.